So what is this called? That gets my goat? Are you kidding me? I'm sure we could come up with some got milk related. We, you and I could sit down, even though it's a 20 year old beaten to death concept. We could find some, I mean, besides the suppositories thing, we could find something <laughs> that's, that's clever. Our junior year of college, there was a contest. Remember a Hallmark card ah, yeah. commercial contest. And maybe this is for, for off the air or whatever, but I participated in it. Because you were supposed to write a Hallmark commercial, then mm-hmm. submit it for this contest. And so if you recall, I wrote like this futuristic sci-fi oh, alien yeah. job the hut type. You got a, this huge bloated corpulent alien king that the human is wanting to impress. And he gets him a Hallmark card on his birthday and it touches this thing's alien heart. And it says Jabugla de Jabugla de Hallmark. Exactly. It was. <laughs> it was I had his dialogue in his alien language, and the only word you understood was Hallmark. Yeah. And I it was it freaking well. brilliant, all right? I don't care if I sound like Abby Hilton. <laughs> well, the teacher, it was. The teacher said that it was, uh, it, it was a Super, Super Bowl, Bowl commercial, ad. yeah. So. But we sent in the friggin' things, and what won? A Hallmark commercial that was just like every other Hallmark commercial that you'd ever seen. Now, uh, granted, it was designed to warm the heart of grandparents right. rather than Gen Xers or whatever. They're like, whoa, did she do that commercial, man? Oh, pass me the bong. But it was a wake-up call. It was an example of what was to come, really, to see my commercial lose to something that wasn't as good because that's not what they wanted. Mm-hmm. They wanted... Something familiar. Com- familiarity. Yeah, c- comfort food. They wanted something that wouldn't stand out, that would be like everything else. You know, it, it bugs me when you and I will go to a movie and we see trailers And you're just like, wow, I've seen that movie before. Oh, wow, that one doesn't even try. It's like, oh, I like that movie back when it was called Fifth Element or, you know, whatever it (laughs) might be. And it just... Fifth Element, come on, nobody's copying Fifth Element. (laughs) Well, (laughs) I wish that were so. Oh, everything is either a blatant out in the open remake of something else or a ripoff of something else. Right, but Fifth Element is neither remade or ripped off. It's ripped off constantly, dude. <laughs> it's a failure. Nobody wants to fail like it did. In fact, I, help me out here. Do you remember before Fifth Element, a movie where a five foot two, 98 pound girl beat up on great big muscular dudes and was able to take them down and all that stuff. You see that all the time now, but I don't remember ever seeing it Didn't before Fifth Element. Did Vampire Slayer come out before Fifth Element? Uh, Christy Swanson was friggin' hot. She wasn't whatever. Well, that's whatever fine, but we're she was still about. really small. She used Waif Fu to take down the uh, bad guys. I'll bet Christy Swanson wasn't even a waif. That was like the perfect chick. Okay, I can give you that. She's still tiny, though. I mean, she was not not like oh, tiny, she's not as tiny in, as in like skinny, but she's not like a large one. She's not freaking like Lucy Lawless or something like that. She was a cheerleader in the movie. <laughs> Cheerleaders are always like five foot two and ninety eight pounds. That's See, I just... didn't know that. I thought we were supposed to lust after cheerleader. I thought cheerleaders were the best of the best. The hottest girl in school is the head of the cheerleading squad. That is a stereotype that has lasted since the fifties when they invented teenagers. But uh, they're also the, always the smallest girls in school, so you can pick them up and throw them in fifty feet in the air and catch them without. Oh, see, I breaking thought all of the neck or all anything. of the game fodder girls, the ones that they don't mind if they break their ankle or neck. All are those, those little the ones tiny throw? ones, but <laughs> good looking ones are the ones at the bottom of the pyramid pitching them. No, they don't even participate <laughs> in the pyramid. They're over they here not. getting the crowd all excited. They stand in front of the pyramid and shake their pom poms and their tushy. Oh, good times. <laughs> Anyways, now we're really off topic. How did we even get to that? <laughs> I guess the same old movie. Here's a question for you. What is your favorite Got Milk commercial that you remember? Well, the Aaron Burr one comes to mind because, I, and I didn't realize it was the first one, but boy, it was good. Yeah, you and remember. And did you see who directed that? No. Who was it? Michael Bay directed the commercial. <laughs> That's how we got to start was on Got Milk commercials, huh? I'm trying to remember. There was another one that was really, really funny. There was and it wasn't that... the one where the kid was stuffed his... Oh, there was the, the Damien yeah, one. Yeah, I was going to oh. talk about that one that I really enjoyed where 
that Damien kid and his like guardian or whatever is walking along with him and he's like, wait, stop. And they'd stop and like a tree would fall down right in front of him. And then they like do something else and he'd be like, oh. And, you know, he, he, he kept seeing the future or whatever. And then he gets to the birthday party and all the kids are playing and everybody's eating their cake. And the kid goes, don't eat the cake. And everybody stops for a second. And they look at him. And then they're like, whatever. Freak. And they all eat the cake. And then all of a sudden the mom comes screaming. She runs in. Ah, ah, we're out of milk. And then all the people with the cake are like and they can't like swallow and they're like oh and then it's just got milk <laughs> i loved that one I, I remember at the time that i first saw it you thought i had I, written that commercial <laughs> <laughs> i was working at a tv station in sacramento with this guy who did a public late access. yeah public access it was originally a late night show that was on the air of the station that we worked for because we had basically dead air from like 3 a.m to 5 a.m and so they would just put on old public domain movies during this time. And the guy talked to the people at the station. And, hey, can I host these public domain movies? And they're like, eh, whatever. It's three in the morning. Who cares? And so he started making a show where he was the late night movie host. And he would get public domain movies that were, you know, cheesy drive-in kind of movies. Creature from the Black Lagoon kind of a thing. And so we started watching for things that we could include. I actually started editing stuff for him. And we were watching for things that we could include into the show. So when commercials that were paranormal or something like that would come on, I'd be like, oh, there's that one. Let's save that. And we'd pull out the newscast, the tape of the newscast and like dub off that commercial and use it later. And that was one of the ones that I saved was that one of the, the Damien kid. I thought it was pretty funny. See, but knowing what I know about television, what compared to you, I know very little. But how the hell did you get away with showing old commercial you know what i mean it's like technically they should have paid you <laughs> to show those commercials and if not you still needed their permission to show those commercials. but because yeah, it was just... public access does just anything go on public access See, i don't understand that or it think, wasn't public access well it wasn't public access to begin with it later was by the time i was working at it it was on the public access station instead but uh i think we just Figured nobody would care. Heck, we're showing a commercial um, for free. So they're not going to come and be like, hey, you can't show our commercial for free. So we just said screw it and used it. Well, see, my favorite radio station, the year I graduated from high school, you know, they had a morning show and everybody has a morning show. And I remember like the year that I started college, they advertised, okay, you know, this Friday we're going to do a listener request show where you can request the songs and the commercials that we play in between the songs. And so people were requesting commercials from like six years before and stuff <laughs> like that. And I heard so many commercials that I hadn't heard for so long. And it was awesome. And one day at like a, a public appearance, I asked the DJs, well, how come you guys don't ever do that again? I listened all the way through, including the commercials. And I know other people did too, because we talked about them. And he's like, oh, we got in so much trouble for that. And he's huh. like, you know, we weren't supposed to. I mean, some of these products don't exist anymore. And, you know, the, the, the deals have fallen through. And, and, and there was just so much, you know, paperwork or whatever that, that would have had to have. You know, we, we just we got in trouble. We weren't supposed to do it. We'll never do that again. And I was huh. disappointed, but it made me think of that when you talked about. But yeah, we actually. I, I, there I was got, a Frankenstein commercial that I remember was. you recorded and used on Cinema's Bizarro or whatever. Wait, what? Cinema Insomnia was Insomnia, what it was called. Uh, um, what's his name? Chris Wyatt's show was Cinema Bizarro. Uh. And he had a public access kind of thing or whatever that I wrote for that didn't. As far as I know, it didn't ever go anywhere, so all of that work was in vain. But story of everyone's life, unless you're not creative, unless you're that suit. But uh, Cinema Insomnia, does it still exist? Did you know, I really don't know. I would be surprised if it didn't in some form or another. Because he loved it or because yeah. it was popular? or because Mr. What? Lobo was pretty committed to Cinema Insomnia. He was trying to make it expand. He actually had got some station in like Arkansas to start showing his show. You know, they were like a awesome brand new station in Arkansas that just opened up and they wanted something. And so they were showing Cinema Insomnia and he was trying to get he had like a guy that was a account executive that was trying to sell ads for the show so they could actually make money off of it and stuff like I don't know if he ever got any sold because it wasn't too long after that time that either he stopped working at the station or I, I can't remember if he was still there. I think he left the station to try and 
work on this thing more as a job full time. Yeah, as a job. Wow. But, but, but you used to tell me these stories and I would be so jealous of it because it seemed like such a creative environment. And also the idea of anything goes is really attractive to me. <laughs> and, and that's yeah. sort of the deal with the Dune Steve. If I were more ambitious, we could do all sorts of crazy things. But like mm, if I was able to accomplish your ambitions, I think is a lot more of a freaking Transformer movie is a sad example oh, of that. Well, that's a good point. But like the Superman 2 thing, or I mean, I guess it's the first Superman, the, me getting thrown off the show or uh-huh. the interview bringing in Hulk and things like that. Uh, I mean, just those kind of things. I, if I had the energy, I would do them all the time. Mm-hmm. But I don't. And... So few people, like we, as we said before, so few people listen to even our main show. Or if many, many people listen, they don't comment on, oh, gee, I liked so-and-so right. that you did. So that doesn't make me want to do it more. But yeah, it would just be... I, I remember one time we opened it up to the audience to define the word Dune Steve. And somebody did like a really good job. And did we do it on the show or did we just mean to and we never did? I think we may have done it. So we've had a couple of people where they just sent in. Uh, one guy like sent in several definitions for Dune Steve. And we used several of them over time. And there was some others that it, I think we may have gotten hate letters from people <laughs> as well that we could use for the hate letter segment and so forth. Well, OK. if And I know that only five people listen to this show. But if you want to write us a hate letter and it's amusing, we will read it on the show totally. And to a lesser extent, doing Steve definitions, if you want to do that, I like when people like the the song, the Dune Steve song that uh-huh. Melissa, the Melissa Hills wrote for us. I listened to that the other day because it just said Dune Steve. It didn't say what right. it was called. And I was like, what is this? And I was just like, I grinned so big. And I was just like, wow, that somebody did that. And at this point, the cross stitch thing has already aired. So people know that somebody did a, what was it called? It was an Asshat Magic Spider cross stitch. That somebody likes the show that much to do something creative or something to just make us smile is so freaking great. And see that when, when Mr. Lobo or when your friend you would tell me these things about it. I was just like, oh my gosh, I want to move to Sacramento to work on this show <laughs> uh-huh. because it was up my alley. And the idea of that late night horror movie host or whatever, that was probably done before I was even born. But, you know, there, there was Zachary and there was the most famous was Elvira. And she turned that into a whole career mm-hmm. and, and all that. But just the idea of just having fun and in your little local station and, I don't know. There, that's something that we can understand doing what we do because there are big shows, quote unquote, corporate shows out there. And then there are little indie shows. I mean, this is practically public domain because we pay for it ourselves. Right. Yeah, there was it was fun to work on that show. Really, when it came down to it, but my window of time of actually working on it was fairly short. I only got to do a couple of episodes to it before he took it off to somebody else who had better equipment and they became the editor instead because they were able to do this and that and the other and it was super fancy and all I had was tape to tape, cuts only kind of stuff. Hmm. But I, I really enjoyed that. And that Frankenstein commercial that you were talking about was the one where you see Frankenstein from the movie and he's like, and he's all stiff and stuff. And then Frankenstein's like, oh, look at these old movies. That was me. Can you believe that? But since I started using this uh, arthritis medicine, I can do all stuff that I'd never thought. And he's doing like yoga and all this kind of crap. And I was like, that's perfect for the show. See, commercials can be art. I commercials love commercials. They can be memorable, they can be funny, they can make you cry. And so when I see somebody, ha- not even half-ass it, like one-fifth of their ass or, or, <laughs> or like the, the little boil on the underside of someone's ass, that's all they put into it. It just, it sucks because, and you know me, that's what I measure everything against is whether this person made enough money to buy a house uh-huh. with what they do. That makes you a professional. And I see these people that do crap work bottom of the barrel useless worthless work and they're successful in it it just oh i gnash my teeth and i right. t- pull out chunks of my hair and i, oh, I collect yeah. four skins from the computer Ooh. guy yeah it's funny because i'm i'm 
somebody who really like you know a, a lot of people I'll, I'll watch stuff with people and they get frustrated with me because sometimes i'll actually skip back because oh that commercial was funny have you seen this commercial before you know and i'll, I'll, I'll show stuff because i love commercials when they're well done they're so great well you and i used to we did a whole episode didn't we or it was a whole outtake about the adrian peterson commercial don't be silly adrian peterson commercial <laughs> we did a whole episode on that yeah I, I don't remember what it was for i'm sure it was beer but what it was a great actually for commercial. A watching football on your phone. Oh, okay. Yeah, there. I mean, there's lots of commercials that are like that, and then there's others that aren't. But you know, I'm one of those people where I could. I, I look at commercials and I'm just like, oh, that was the Citizen Kane of commercials or something like that. You know. In general, I'm a, I'm a weird person for liking commercials. Most no, people are just I like don't... skip, 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 skip. Okay, the show's back. And maybe that does make us weird. But I think that because commercials can be art or funny or memorable or life-changing or inspiring or whatever, fill in the blank, that more people would, you know, would respond to them. But people just assume you're talking about the commercial that you want to yeah. fast forward and all that. But uh, what is your all-time favorite commercial? And I will tell you mine. To be continued. That gets my go is produced under a Creative Commons 3.0 license. Oh, look. Okay. The Sean Whalen one was the very first one, the, the Aaron Burr, which was probably the best of all of those. Oh, that's the, where he's got a mouthful. And he's like, whoa, whoa, and like, no, I'm sorry. The answer was Aaron Burr. And, but he's and he's got Aaron Burr yeah, paraphernalia. He's got the all bullet. <laughs> it's like show some fi- shooting in this, in this freaking the bullet on a little. That was great. Okay. Anyways, um, 